Hey, how are you guys doing today? It's almost February 2021. Uh, before I start, um, I want you guys to go check out this other channel. Um, I don't know the guy. So just a little disclaimer, I don't know the guy at all. Um, his name is Hud Oberly, um, and I'm going to put a link down in the description. Um, he's got a lot of different videos, but the videos that I like are uh, some of the, some of the, I, I believe he's from Pahuska. Um, and some of the videos are about the Osage Nation. Um, and so if you want to learn more about uh, the Osage culture, um, dances, music, um, dress, you might go check out his, his channel. So, all right. So we are in chapter four, the underground Re reservation, and this is going to be part two. Many Osage students at Molly's school tried to flee, but lawmen chased them on horseback and bound them with ropes, hauling them back. Molly attended class eight months each year, and when she did return to Gray Horse, she noticed that more and more girls had stopped wearing their blankets and moccasins, that the young men had exchanged their breechcloths for trousers and their uh, scalp locks for broad-brimmed hats. Many students began to feel embarrassed by their parents, who didn't understand English, and still lived by the old ways. An Osage mother said of her son, his, eye, his ears are closed to our talk. I'm gonna say that one more time. His ears are closed to our talk. Wow. Molly's family was straddling not only two centuries, but two civilizations. Her, family, her, her family's distress increased in the late 1890s as the U.S. government intensified its push for the culmination of its assimilation campaign, allotment. Under the policy, the Osage Reservation would be divvied up into 160-acre parcels into real estate, with each tribal member receiving one allotment, while the rest of the territory would be open to settlers. The allotment system, which had already been imposed on many tribes, was designed to end the old communal way of life and turn American Indians into private property owners, a situation that would not incidentally make it easier to procure their land. The Osage had seen that happen to the Cherokee outlet, a vast prairie that was part of the Cherokee territory and was the, near the western border of the Osage Reservation. After the U.S. government purchased the land from the Cherokee, it had announced that at noon on September 6th, 16th, 1893, a settler would be able to claim one of the 42,000 parcels of land if he or she got to the spot first. Now that, that that's, you know, again, this is where you, you hear the word sooner. You know, I want to get there. I'm going to go, I'm going to go early. I'm going to get there sooner. For days before the starting date, tens of thousands of men, women, and children had come from as far away as California and New York and gathered along the boundary. The ragged, dirty, desperate mass of humanity stretched across the horizon like an army pitted against itself. Finally, after several Sooners who tried to sneak across the line early had been shot, the starting gun had sounded. Check out this picture here. A race for land such as was never witnessed on earth. As one newspaper put it, a reporter wrote, men knocked each other down as they rushed onward. Women shrieked and fell, fainting only to be trampled and perhaps killed. The reporter continued, men, women, and horses were, were laying all over the prairie. Here and there were, were, were fighting to the death over claims with which each maintained he was first to reach. Knives and guns were drawn. It was a terrible and exciting scene. No pen can do it justice. 
It was a struggle where the game was emphatically every man for himself and devil take the, the hindmost. By nightfall, the Cherokee outlet had been carved into pieces, but the Osage had purchased their land. It was harder for the government to impose its policy of allotment. The tribe led by one of its greatest chiefs, James Big Heart, who spoke seven languages, among them Sioux, French, English, Latin, and who had taken to wearing a suit was able to forestall the process. But pressure was mounting. Theodore Roosevelt had already warned what would befall an Indian who refused his allotment. Let him like let him, like these whites who will not work, perish from the face of the earth, which he com which which he cumbers. By the early 20th century, Big Heart and, and other Osage knew that they no longer that they could no longer avoid what a government official called the Great Storm Gathering. The U.S. government planned to break up Indian territory and make it a part of what would be, be a new state called Oklahoma. In the Choctaw language, Oklahoma means red people. Big Heart had succeeded in delaying the process for several years. The Osage were the last tribe in Indian territory to be allotted, and this had given the Osage more leverage as the government officials were eager to avoid any final impediments to statehood. In 1904, Big Heart sent a zealous young lawyer named John Palmer across the country to keep his finger on the Washington pulse. The orphan son of a white trader and a Sioux woman, Palmer had been adopted as a child by an Osage family and had since married an Osage woman. A U.S. Senator from Oklahoma called Palmer the most eloquent Indian alive. For months, Big Heart and Palmer and other members of the tribe negotiated with official government officials over the terms of allotment. The Osage prevailed upon the government to divide the land slowly, solely among members of the tribe thereby increasing each individual's allotment from 160 acres to 657 acres. This strategy would avoid a mad dash on their territory, though whites could then attempt to buy allotments from tribe members. The Osage also managed to slip into the government into the agreement what seemed at the time like a curious provision. Now listen to this, that the oil, gas, or other minerals covered by the lands are hereby reserved to the Osage tribe. Let me read that one more time. That the oil, the gas, coal, or other minerals covered by the lands are hereby reserved by the Osage tribe. Now, I don't know about for other states, but I know in Oklahoma, um, you own your property. You know, I, at one time I owned a house in Tulsa you own your property. I did not own the mineral rights to my to my property. So that's a pretty common thing. I don't know what it's like in other states, but in Oklahoma, people will own the land or they may own the mineral rights or both. The tribe knew there were some oil deposits under the reservation. More than a decade earlier, an Osage Indian had had shown John Florer, the owner of the trading post, and Greyhost a rainbow sheen floating on the surface of a creek in the eastern part of the, res of the reservation. The Osage Indian dapped his blanket at the spot and then squeezed the liquid into a container. Florer thought that the liquid smelled like axle grease sold in his store, and he rushed back and showed the sample to others who confirmed his, suspic his suspicions. It was oil. With the tribe's approval, Floor and a wealthy banking partner obtained a lease to begin drilling on the reservation. Few imagined that the tribe was sitting on a fortune, but by the time of the allotment negotiations, several smelly wells had begun operating, and the Osage shrewdly managed to hold on to this last realm of their land, a realm they could not even see. After the terms of the Allotment Act, were agreed upon in 1906, Palmer boasted to Congress, 
I wrote that Osage Agreement out in longhand. Mm. Like others on the Osage tribal roll, Molly and her family members each received a head right, essentially a share in the tribe's mineral trust. When the following when the following year, Oklahoma entered the Union as the 46th state, members of the tribe were able to sell their surface land in what was now Osage County. But to keep the mineral, but to keep the mineral trust un, um, under tribal control, no one could buy or sell head rights. These could only be inherited. Molly and her family had become part of the first underground reservation. I'm going to stop there. Hey guys, if you've enjoyed this, um, please give me a like, please give me a thumbs up. Feel free to comment. Um, and I will do part three either later today or tomorrow. Thank you.